everyone. It's good afternoon here in the UK. Welcome to our talk. Um, our guest today is Dr. Joseph Omahni. Uh, Joseph is an Associate Professor of International Relations um, at the University of Reading. He's been previously been um, a Stanton Fellow in MIT's Security Studies Program, taught at a certain whole School of Diplomacy and Brown University, and received a PhD in Political Science from George Washington University. His primary area of research is international norm dynamics, including norms surrounding war, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and human rights, all very relevant in today's environment. Uh, and his talk is going to be about the uh, annotation for Transparent Inquiry Initiative, which is a project to develop a tool for qualitative researchers that enables them to create enhanced annotations in papers, articles, and link to digital copies of archival sources in trusted repositories, which addresses the critical problem of transparency and reproducibility for archives-based research. So, because hard copy archival documents are often difficult to access in person and digital surrogates may not have been made available by the archive holders. So Joseph will, was involved in the project to pilot this valuable tool and has published a practical guide based on his experience. In our chat function, I'm going to uh, share a website page where you can uh, find more information on, um, in this, on this particular open research case study. And yeah, if you have any questions, you can also leave them in the chat function. Meanwhile, uh, without much ado, I will ask Joseph to start his talk, please. Sure thing. Um, can you hear me? OK. Yes. OK. Uh, so yes, hello. Thank you very much for um, having me to give this talk. Um, I think this is a really great um, opportunity for qualitative researchers. Um, and I am a bit of an evangelist for this. I think that this should be more widespread. Um, and I think it actually has the opportunity to uh, really radically increase the transparency and reproducibility of uh, qualitative research, particular types of qualitative research that I'll talk about. OK, so the title of my talk is Annotating for Transparent Inquir Inquiry and Qualitative Research, Making Archival Documents Accessible. This is the structure of the, my talk today. I'm going to talk about the problem a little bit with some illustrations. Then I'm going to say something about a solution to that problem in general, um, which is the uh, annotation for. For the pilot project. Um, as an example, which will help to really illustrate, I think, uh, some of the benefits and also the costs of, um, of of doing this sort of thing. OK, so let me start with. An example that illustrates the problem. Recently, um, Russia invaded Ukraine. And um, there's been a lot of rhetoric around why Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has made lots of public statements and arguments and written an essay, which you can read online, where he talks about his uh, opinions about why um, Ukraine should be part of Russia and Russia should have control over Ukraine and that sort of thing. And when we're thinking about what's true about why Russia invaded Ukraine and whose fault it is that Russia invaded Ukraine. One of the big issues in the discourse has been the expansion of NATO after the end of the Cold War to states in uh, more states in Eastern Europe, right? And so one of the talking points in this discourse has been that the US promised Russia that NATO would not expand after the Cold War. And then the US broke that promise by expanding NATO after the end of the Cold War, right? Now, it would be good if we knew whether this claim was true or not, right? That would be very useful to everybody, both sort of practically and politically, but also for, you know, I want to say political science and international relations research. This is my, this is my area. Um, 
it would be very useful to know if this was true. Okay, so how do we know if it's true? Well, there's been various articles published about this. So one thing we could do is we can go and read an article uh, that talks about this, this issue. And so uh, this is a sort of extract from one such article by Joshua Schifrinson, well-regarded article, um, where he goes into a lot of detail about who said what to whom um, between the US and uh, the Soviet Union, in particular, James Baker and Eduard Shevardnadze um, and Gorbachev in February 1990. Okay, so here's the, here's the, the, the key bit here. So there's, there's a meeting, uh, James Baker of the US talking to Shevardnadze and Gorbachev, and he says, for example, there would be no extension of NATO's jurisdiction for forces of NATO one inch to the east, right? If Germany reunified within NATO. So this is partly about the, reuni re reuni re the reunification of Germany and how the Soviet Union feels about that. Um, now, Schifrinson writes this in his paper, not one inch to the east. Right. But how do we know that that's true? Right. How do we know it's true that Baker actually said that? Well, the standard sort of way that this works is there's a citation. OK, let's look at the citation. Here's a citation for this section. Memorandum of conversation. Right between Secretary of State and Edward Shevardnadze. This is in box 38. Soviet flashpoints, NSA. Now the NSA is the National Security Archive. This is a citation to a piece of paper that is in a box, box number 38, on the top floor of the library of George Washington University in Washington, DC, right? Now, say we look at this citation, what can we do with this? We can be like, oh, okay, well, that seems pretty convincing, I'll move on. But what if we wanna know, well, what is it? Does it really say that? Maybe there's been a mistake. What's the context of uh, within the document of where that quote comes from? How are we supposed to interpret this? And we have no access to this because it's in Washington, D.C. And I mean, if you live in Washington, D.C. and you can get access to G uh, GW University, then that's fine. But for almost everybody, you can't. Right. And so we've absolutely no idea ourselves if it's actually true that this statement, not one inch, was actually made. Yeah, we have to take Schifrinson's word for it um, or, or, or writing for it. OK, and so this is a, this is one example of a much broader problem, which is all of political science research that uses primary source historical evidence suffers from this problem. As uh, our host, Shahag, said earlier, there are some digital representations online and people are uh, there are institutions, for example, the National Security Archive um, is making a lot more um, of, uh, documents uh, available online. So that's so they're actually putting them uh, digital representations of these, these online, much more so than ever used to be. Um, but there's still a lot of these documents which are not available. And even if they're in some online uh, repository somewhere, how do you know that that's the case? So even if so Schifrinson's citing to this document, that document might be online somewhere, you've no way of knowing where it is. Okay, so just this idea that these sources are inaccessible in all sorts of different ways is a huge problem for really knowing if all these claims that people are making, which are of huge international political importance, right, um, about whether or not we should change NATO, support Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, or invade Ukraine, I guess. Um, very important, and we don't know. We don't have access. And let me give you another couple of, just a, a couple of sort of personal anecdotes when I've been trying to get access to documents that I've seen cited for my own research, my own per personal research purposes. So um, a sort of best case scenario was I was reading a paper and it made a reference to a, um, uh, a memo that was written for Henry Kissinger. He was going to uh, Japan to talk about uh, various things, including uh, Japan's ratification of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. 
and it made a claim and cited to this document. And I was like, well, I'm really interested in this. I wrote a paper about this topic and I want to know more about what this document says. So I emailed the author of the paper and said, you make this claim in your paper and you cite this document. I'm really interested in this. Do you have a copy of this document? And that guy, and so like I say, this is a best case scenario. That guy, he um, then sent me a link, a temporary, a, a time delimited link to his doc Dropbox folder where I was able to download not just that document, but all the other documents um, that he'd taken a photo of, personally taken a photo of in the archive. So I could download those and see the original, the, the document of the claim, supporting the claim that I was interested in, and then the surrounding documents. So that's the sort of best case scenario. Um, but even then, I had to email the guy, and he might have said no, and you've no way of knowing if that's, you know, and he can't respond to everybody who's interested in this necessarily. So that's my first anecdote. My second anecdote is I was uh, reading a book about Canadian nuclear diplomacy, and I saw a claim which seemed very problematic to me. I was like, I'm surprised that they're making this claim. This seems like it's wrong. If it's if it's right, this is going to change my mind about um, uh, my research that, that, that I'm doing on uh, Canadian nuclear diplomacy. So I emailed the author of, of this book and asked him, oh, you say this in your book. Can I, do you have access to this document? And this guy said, I have no idea about this document. I don't have access to it. I don't remember it at all. Maybe it was my friend's document that I had a look at. So I emailed the friend. The friend's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And so it's like, well, now we have this claim. And it's like, well, I have no idea. And I can't, in, you know, in, in, I don't know if this claim is true or not. I can't rely on this claim. Can I go to the Canadian? It's very difficult to access the Canadian archives relative to the British and American archives that I mostly deal with, right? Not just, even if I was able to go there, um, there's all sorts of restrictions on getting access to these. Uh, lots of uh, lots of archives are only available to Canadian citizens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically this, this claim is now utterly useless to me because I've no idea if it's true or what it actually says. So that's a sort of bad bad case scenario. And in fact, most scenarios are like that um, in my experience. Now it's not just getting access to the document itself. It's also when you're reading a paper and someone cites to, if, they, if they're quoting a document, that's one thing. But oftentimes those people will cite a document for a claim uh, in support of a claim and not give you a direct quote. You can't read, lots of papers involve huge amounts of analysis and interpretation. And a lot of that is not made super explicit because it would be uh, often sort of impossible to read if you were going uh, in, in, in detail in every single claim. Um, and so it's not just that the sources themselves, the documents are inaccessible, it's also that the interpretation behind how did the author go from the document to the, the interpretive claim that they're making, right? Um, that is also inscrutable. It's impossible to know unless they explicit, they make the whole paper about inter that kind of interpretation, which is unusual. Um, and then there's a third sort of problem here, which is that the, it's often the case that the context, even if e the context is unknown, even if you have a quote from a document, um, you don't know what the text around that quote is. So, and that can often be very important for interpreting what has actually been said and what is the meaning of that, um, of that speech act or, or, or whatever. Um, but what's also often an issue is not just the text around it, but where it, what kind of document it is and where it sits within the document. This can also be really important, right? And so this is all a problem at the moment with, uh, in particular, with qualitative research that uses sort of archival documents, but any political science research or international relations research uh, that uses primary source historical evidence uh, there's been several high profile um, examples um, that have led to people publicizing this kind of issue. There was one well known uh, sort of uh, debate in print between uh, Andrew Moravchik and Sebastian Rosato, and they disagreed about interpretations of the documents. And some people have gone to the archives and said, well, we looked at the archive, we couldn't find any of these documents you cited, blah, 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 blah. So even when people do go to the archives, it can be hard to get access to them. Okay. So this is a huge problem. What's the solution? Well, the solution in general, one solution in general, I suppose, is 
is this annotation for transparent inquiry initiative um, which is an initiative sort of run by or proposed by uh, people behind the qualitative data repository uh, out of Syracuse University. And so um, what what their idea was, was to um, use a software, so it's the hypothesis software, um, to create an extra overlay, an extra feature for papers which which are uh, online. So there's a digital overlay on top of these articles, which gives a link, an annotation, a link to an annotation, which I'll talk more about the details of that in a second, a link to an annotation, which you can embed into uh, journal web pages, right? And so this um, includes uh, analytic notes, uh, in, which talk about where the data comes from and talks about how the analysis works for all of this uh, all this data. It includes an excerpt and also a link to those data sources, right? Um, and so they have they have um, uh, uh, repositories of so you can you can deposit your qualitative data uh, with the qualitative data repository. And then whenever anyone around the world is reading your article uh, on the journal web page, they can see these annotations, they can click on it, they can see all the information uh, uh, next to it, and then they can click on um, a link that gives them uh, uh, the data sources, allows them to download or view the data sources. And this is just such a great idea because it addresses all of these problems which are endemic in political science research or qualitative research that uses these documents. OK. Um, all right, so that's the solution in general. How does it actually play out in practice in particular? So let me um, talk about my paper. Um, I worked with ATI in a pilot uh, project, a pilot phase of this of this uh, project, and I annotated my paper. Now, I'll give you a little bit of context just so you can understand some of the stuff uh, going on. I won't take too long here. But so it used to be, to start off, it used to be the case that Pakistan had, was in two different places, right? It was a single country, um, but half of it was West Pakistan and half of it was East Pakistan. Uh, here's a map here that shows that they were, one, one, one bit was on either side of India, right? Um, and then uh, there, was a, there was an election which uh, where the people from East Pakistan won the election. So they would they they would they were in control of the government. And the existing military run government in West Pakistan didn't like this and so um, did a whole bunch of uh, uh, I guess you could say war, violence. It's, it's routinely cited as a genocide in East Pakistan. Um, and then East Pakistan tried to become independent from West Pakistan um, and East Pakistan then wanted to become a country called Bangladesh. OK, so they declared themselves Bangladesh. India had invaded East Pakistan, partly to stop the flow of refugees from coming across the border, partly to stop the genocide, I guess. Um, um, and, and perhaps for other reasons. But so India had invaded East Pakistan. East Pakistan declared independence as Bangladesh. Now, other states, other countries had to make a choice. Are they going to recognize Bangladesh as an independent state? Now, we know that in the end, they basically all did. But at the time, it was extremely controversial, right? And so my paper basically explains why and how um, Bangladesh and the UK in particular were able to um, uh, use argumentation, diplomatic argumentation, to um, change people's minds about whether they, uh, other states' minds about whether they should recognize Bangladesh as an independent state. And I used a lot of primary sources, um, which I uh, accessed from various places, including the National Archives uh, at Kew. Okay, so here's my paper, and you can see here um, that in addition to saving this article as a PDF, sharing it, citing it, there's also this bit next to it, which says that there are 34 annotations, right? 
which you can click on that, or you can click on them throughout the throughout the paper. Um, okay, now um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you um, an example, or a couple of examples of how I use the annotations to massively improve the transparency and reproducibility of my claims in this paper. All right. So first up, um, I'll say that in what's standard in making in making claims in this type of research is um, you make you make claims, you make a lot of claims, and you base your claims upon a lot of different type pieces of evidence. Okay. And so if you just had one document that you were basing your whole paper on, that'd be one thing. But you know we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents uh, that are often used uh, in in making claims in this sort of research, um, right? And so that's why in the paper as published, I made a whole bunch of claims, and frankly, I didn't justify them very much, right? Because that is the standard situation. Without annotation for transfer and inquiry, the standard situation is to do this. Okay, so what's what's important? Here is that Sheikh Mujib, who was the um, sort of elected leader of the this new or going to be state of Bangladesh, he was the ele he was the elected leader of Pakistan uh, until he was um, put in prison by the West Pakistan military government. He was released from captivity and went to London, and and in London, one well in London the British government talked to him, right? And one of the things that's, that are, that's important here for my argument is that Mujib did not know, did not realize initially that withdrawing, the, the Indian troop withdrawal was going to be the crucial thing which was going to get Bangladesh recognized, right? Partly because this was an unprecedented situation in, in world politics, right? Uh, it's contrary to international law in all sorts of ways. That's how people were talking about it at this time. Um, and so, but so what, what ended up happening was Mujib and the Bangladesh, uh, people as well as the British government, uh, and India as well, they made this Indian troop withdrawal thing, the, um, the main issue such that, uh, they said, if India withdraws troops, then that means that Bangladesh can be recognized and we won't be breaking international, we won't be breaking any, uh, norms, we won't be. Uh, you know, uh, uh, changing the way that international politics has, um, has 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 been conducted. All right, and so it's very important that Mujib didn't know that Indian troop withdrawal was important and uh, was told by the British that this was what was going to be the issue. And also that the and it's also important that the British thought that the the Indian troop withdrawal was really important. Okay, so in the published article. Um, I say the British government impressed upon Mujib the importance of Indian troop withdrawal for the recognition of Bangladesh. Right. And then I cite to this document in a folder in the National Archives. And who can check? Right. Nobody. Wow. But actually they can now because due to the ATI, when you look at when you go and access this paper online now, there is now this link. There's now you can click on this sentence and you see this annotation pop up right next to it. Um, and so uh, you see here there are several here. And as you go through, there are various uh, There's 34 that you can click on and see these notes. So what what is what what is this annotation? Let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. Um, so there's four parts to this. The first part. Uh, as I did it is an analytic note this describes the document right gives you details about what it is where it's from um, and then it also includes a discussion of why i think this document is evidence of the claim that i'm making right and i have this here um you you could you could make this a lot more um, involved if you if you wanted to. And I think that a lot of the time, if um, a lot of the time that would be much more justified in making this longer. Um, 
And one of the things this does is it completely, or not completely, but it, it, it goes a long way to dealing with the problem that you have no idea why the author of the paper thinks that the document supports the claim, right? Especially if there's some sort of uh, interp some sort of complicated, more uh, interpretive act going on here. All right, so that's the analytic note. Um, and then there's the source excerpt. So I'll provide a, a much, well, in this case, I didn't, do, I didn't quote at all in the document. Here, we have an excerpt from the document that you can read, where you can see what the text of the document says and, and reach your own conclusions about whether that text supports the claim that I'm making based upon my analytic note. Uh, again, you could make this excerpt a lot longer if you wanted to. Then there's a link to the data source, right? And so I took photo, when I was in the archives, I took digital photos of these documents. And so I then uploaded these to the QDR. The QDR now has a, a place uh, in the repository where you can download this document. And so if you want to, maybe I'm making all this other, maybe I'm making this excerpt up, right? But now you can click on it and see that there's a photo of this document. Um, part of that is right here, right? So did I take a great photo here? Perhaps not. Um, take better photos in the in the future, maybe. But um, but this is now proof that this is what it says. So there's no there's no need for me to, for anybody reading the paper to uh, you know worry about if if this is true to have to email anyone to try and get access to this document. Um, they can see this instantly for themselves. They can know that um, this is actually based upon something that's real. Uh, and they can reproduce the analytic process for themselves to see how I got to the claim and then see if they agree with that claim or not and agree with that process and if they have an, or if they have an alternative interpretive thing. Um, with this particular claim, when I was annotating this, because uh, so I, I wrote the paper first and then and went through and annotated it afterwards, I um, was a little bit worried about this because I was making an interpretation here, right? So if you if you if you read this, I mean I don't want to, don't want to go into too much detail here, but basically the British Prime Minister in this meeting, he's meeting with Sheikh Mujib, right? Um, the 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 putative leader of Bangladesh, of putative Bangladesh. And he's being polite, right? <laughs> he's British. He's being polite. He are, and it says here, he asked about Sheikh Mujib's plans for the future of the Indian army. Now, my read of that is that the British prime minister is being, and he's not outright saying, you have to do this, right? The British prime minister is being polite. He's being diplomatic. He's indicating indirectly that the Indian army being in Bangladesh is a real problem for the British recognition of Bangladesh, right? And so I'm making that interpretation, but, you know, that requires a whole lot of background assumptions there, right? Um, and you might read that differently. And so when I was going back and annotating it, I added an extra document, right? So there's a second annotation here with a second, you can see a, a completely different annotation, um, which uh, provides a link to an, a new document, which has an extra piece of evidence supporting that interpretation where in fact um, this is a briefing paper that talks about um, which was given to the Prime Minister in, in preparation for the meeting with Sheikh Majib which also talks about a meeting that was uh, that there was between the Foreign Minister of uh, Bangladesh previously where they were very direct right and said out you know this wasn't a sort of Head of, head of government to head of government um, uh, meeting where they were all being diplomatic and polite. This was a much more direct, they um, they were impressed upon the Bangladeshi foreign minister that withdrawal of the Indian army was a necessary criterion for recognition of Bangladesh by the British, right? Okay, so without all of that, so I, with the annotations, my claim here, which frankly is almost unsupported apart from the citation, which you can't check mostly in the original document. Now with the annotations, we it's so much more 
reliable, more transparent. It's so much more reproducible. There's so much more um, possibility for you to, uh, re you know, uh, go through the analytic process yourself as well in this situation, right? Um, it's so much richer in all sorts of different ways as well. So that I, this is, I think, a really, um, a really good uh, uh, thing that you can do, uh, initiative that you can participate in to uh, improve all of these things. All right. Um, there's there's an extra point that I want to make here. Uh, which is, and this this is not as common an issue, and yet because we now have access to ATI, this is the sort of thing that could be done much more so. Um, right, what, what am I talking about here? Okay, so in the in the paper, I basically say it's not just I, I'm talking about why states recognize Bangladesh, right? And if you want to go into detail in this then you have to, it, it, you, it gets very, very long very quickly, right? If there's huge amounts of words you could write talking about why, in this case, you know, 10, 20, 30 different countries recognize Bangladesh. What I did in the paper, I didn't talk about all of these in detail. I, I had this table where I had um, each of these countries, they had a reason why um, a, a condition that they wanted to see fulfilled before they recognize Bangladesh, Bangladesh, and then my citation. And here are my citation. These citations are to a folder in the Foreign Office archives uh, or the Prime Minister's archives or to um, uh, a uh, Security Council uh, document uh, or the Foreign Relations of the United States series. But so these citations, there is no way, frankly, that you could ever reproduce this in the published article because it's so limited in terms of what you can um, put into into articles like this. Um, you know, you like you find this folder, you'd have to go through the whole folder to, to what what document am I referring to, right? Um, and you could and maybe you could say, well, you should have been more assiduous in being much more detailed in your original citations here, um, which is possibly true, but. Um, but anyway, but what ATI does is it, it effectively completely resolves all these problems, and allows you to make far more um, uh, broad, reliable claims like this about a large number of, of situations. So with ATI, I was able to annotate this table and put 18 annotations, each two documents, which supported these claims, right? Um, so uh, that 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 was, I think, really uh, a, a really transformative moment for me when I realized that this could, you could you, there's now a whole different way of representing qualitative data like this, but not just representing it, but uh, uh, reliable, reliably, reproducibly, transparently presenting qualitative data like this, right? because you can now have these annotations and these links to um, orig uh, original uh, documents um, that, are, that are supporting these claims. And that I, there's a lot of opportunity there, I think, for uh, transforming research practice. Um, OK, so uh, that's my pitch, my examples. Um, just to sort of conclude here, to say that um, the Annotation for Transparent Inquiry Initiative uses this hypothesis software to create a digital overlay um, on published journal articles that increases the transparency of archival research or qualitative research more generally. In the, uh, in the initiative, my paper used archival documents, but there were other pilot, um, uh, other people participating in the pilot who had done interviews and they were able to link to their interview transcripts and other people who had taken photos of various things and that they couldn't put into the original paper and they were able to provide links to the original photos that they'd taken of things. Um, and so this isn't just for archival research, it's much more broadly for qualitative data more generally. Um, it has the possibility here of making qualitative research far more reproducible in all sorts of different ways. Um, 
and allows original data to be more accessible. Now, I did want to say something here about the costs. Okay. And so mm -hmm. often people's reaction to this is, are you kidding? I have to do all of this as well to publish my paper? Oh my God. Right. That's a, it's historians especially, I think, um, although maybe that's not, that not always the case. Um, partly because historians, I think, are uh, used to um, having their own, uh, viewing the, 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 the breadth of the evidence and not even being able to conceive that you would be, be able to give people access to the original documents. They look at the documents, they come to some sort of interpretation, and they're giving that to you. And if you, I think the historian sort of attitude is if you want to disagree with their interpretation, then you have to go and look at all of the evidence yourself, right? Um, and I think often in historians' uh, claims rely perhaps perhaps less on single documents. And so providing someone with a single document is often not enough to make a difference for historians, perhaps. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, although for historians, often single documents are very important. Regardless, um, a lot of people, when they're presented with this, they say, well, this just seems like a huge amount of work that no one's ever going to read, right? Or that I don't need to do to get my paper published. And so, um, um, you know, I think that is a valid concern, right? Um, but basically, I don't think that that it's a valid concern to some extent, but I don't think it matters, right? Um, and the reason I don't think it matters is because if I am interested in finding out if a claim is true or not, right, and I can't get access to the original document, then I basically I can't trust that claim, right? I've, I've, now that I know um, the, now that I know that there is a possibility of getting access to these documents, if you're not providing these documents, then that is a problem. Right, and I see this as kind of analogous to the, um, I don't know, the causal identification re revolution in social sciences, right? Um, over the last 20, 30 years, where it used to be okay to have observational data and 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 you know and and a p value, um, and that would be it. And nowadays, if you don't have a really stringent causal identification strategy, your research is just seen as much much less credible than it than it was 30 years ago, right? Um, and I think that that is a sort of analogous process uh, or, or is likely to be an anal analogous pro process for qualitative research where, you know, if you're not providing online access to your original documents, then nobody can know if they're really true. No one can reproduce it, right? Um, and that will make your research a lot less credible than it would otherwise be. And I think that's uh, that's inescapable. Um, I do think there's a lot of scope for um, for coming up with uh, some like, rules, maybe, or co uh, conventions about uh, how much, how many documents should be provided, or, or whether you need to um, whether you need to support what what types of claims you need to support, or how much access you need to provide, or how much extra analytic um, uh, analytic notes. You need to you need to add in there something like that some conventions about that because uh, I think there is there's a possibility I guess for some sort of arms race such that um, some journals might require way more some journals might not and then they might have all sorts of effects in who publishes where and, and that sort of thing. There's also the case that um, there's also another issue which is are you sort of is it uh, legal or ethical to provide access to these documents right? Um, so the documents I'm working with are declassified government documents. And so that's a sort of best case scenario for making them um, uh, accessible, uh, in, uh, perhaps. But even then, I was told by the archivist that, that I had to, they had to be behind some sort of, um, they couldn't be just completely available for every, anybody to download uh, without going through some sort of uh, identification process. So like they had to have an account with the with the QDR to download these documents, right? But I can totally see the lots of different archives having, uh, and in fact, it is true that lots of different archives have lots of different access requirements. Um, so I know I, I did get access to some Canadian documents where a condition 
of the provision of the document was that it be provided on a CD and mailed to the researcher. That that was the only way in which they were uh, it was it was allowed to provide access to it, and so um, that would not be eligible, right? But that's a separate issue. You know, whether you're allowed to do it, whether you're allowed to access it at all is a separate issue from can you provide it access to it online? I think that's a completely separate issue. Um, but it does mean, I think, that there, it does mean that there's scope for um, coming up with some sort of rules about um, whether you can publish or, or whether you can publish in a journal and not provide access to your documents if you have some sort of access restrictions to those documents. Right. There's also, I think, a lot more. Uh, so if we're talking about sort of interview transcripts, for example, if you're providing access to those interview transcripts uh, online, uh, anonymization perhaps is going to be a lot more difficult. So that's a, that's a consideration for that sort of thing. So there are there are problems and concerns in, in those regards. It is also more work, but um, frankly, it wasn't a lot more work for me because all almost all of that stuff that I provided, I had anyway. I just wasn't able to provide it in the paper, right? Because of word limits and, you know, conventions, existing conventions about how you cite um, cite claims, cite, cite evidence and that sort of thing. Um, so it wasn't actually a lot more work for me to do to produce these annotations, right? Um, than, it, than it was to write the paper in the first place. All right, so I guess I've covered my main points. I don't know if I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I suppose. Yeah, mm. thanks very much, Joseph. Um, that was very interesting and provoked some questions. Uh, I was thinking that, yes, on your point that it's you still, you, you, you do this job anyway. <laughs> so I was thinking that because I also do conduct call to the research from time to time. So probably, and a part of this is doing your notes, writing your memos. Is my understanding correct that some of them may actually constitute a part of an annotation? Some of this analytic um, notes your, for your research process. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so, you know, one part of the annotation uh, could be, I mean, I mean, you can do it, you can write anything you like in these, right? Um, but the sort of standard for the ATI is to have an analytic note, which is the, the idea is to be a, a, an interpretive bridge between the document or, or whatever it is, the text, and your claim that you're making based upon that, right? And so that explains how you got access to it and what, why you think that this support, why this evidence supports this claim. Right. So just check my understanding. So it's about providing the context and the the logic behind your interpretation, how you arrive at this conclusion. Yes. In addition to the factual element of the annotation. That's right. Okay. Um, and yes, you did touch uh, on the uh, on potential unwillingness to engage in this initiative. So uh, what motivation can you think about in this regard? So what can motivate researchers to to do to start doing it more. Um, OK, so I'm going to be super pompous for a second <laughs> to start with. And the super pompous sort of response there is, well, do you want to do you believe in the truth or not? Right. Do you want to know if it's true or not? And um, uh, so you might be motivated because you want to produce the best most reliable research that you can possibly do, right? And so some people are more motivated in this respect than others. Um, I, th I think that there is a, a sort of a one argument against, which is um, which is pretty good. I don't think it's a Trump argument, but I think it's a pretty good argument, which is that if everybody is doing this, it will slow down everybody because they'll have to put so much more work into each article that it will mean that less research gets done in terms of quantity, right? And I think that is perhaps true, although less true than, I, I think the, 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 the effect size of that is actually much smaller than people think, because like I say, you have to do this, you have to produce the claim in the first place on the evidence, right? And so just like 
writing down uh, how you did that um, doesn't actually take a ton of time, in my experience. Um, but lots of people are not motivated for that, right? And so, um, uh, you know, and people obviously do what jump through hoop, whatever hoops they have to jump through to get their papers published. And so one thing, when I've published, so I've published uh, paper, papers that have quantitative data, and now, and this was not true when I first started publishing, but it is true now, everywhere is like, we need you to provide your original data file and uh, the process by which you analyzed it. How did you, so what is the code that you used mm -hmm. to produce your figures or to produce your your um, co coefficient estimates, right? You have to provide that. And they won't let you publish in the, in the journal unless you do that, in lots of journals. Not all journals. Some journals are still like, you can put data available or prom request, right, in your acknowledgments or whatever it is. Um, but lots of journals are requiring you to either uh, give the journal itself the data or upload your data to an online repository, um, which is open access, right? And so uh, you could have journals that do this. You could have uh, funding bodies, perhaps, um, could say you have to have some sort of uh, plan for making your documents available, mm -hmm. right? And ATI would salt would serve that purpose, I think, very well in lots of cases, and especially in the types of research that I'm talking about, like foreign policy decision-making research, international relations research. Um, and so that's a, a possibility or some, you know, something that I can see happening in the medium term future. And do you have any information about the, I wouldn't say statistics, but maybe in some indications of to what extent it's already used? Oh, I don't think it's used very much at all. Right. This is very early, so I think, um, and partly I think that it is uh, not used so much is is because um, I think it's a generational thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, talk, I mean, I'm feeling old recently, right? But you know, um, I still am. Uh, I grew up with the internet, right? Uh, to some extent, but I think that a lot of academia is still coming, quali qualitative academia perhaps, in, especially like in political science, I think qualitative scholars, um, especially sort of the, the people who are in power, so to speak, are not um, have, are not as de dedicated to the idea or, or even aware. Like when you tell people that you can do this, that often people are surprised. Oh, I didn't even realize you could do that, right? Um, uh, the, the, the technological rate of change here is very, very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that ac academic practices much, much or institutional practice is much slower mm -hmm. um, to to uh, adapt to this technological change. Um, but so, you know, the easier it, the easier it is to do, that's good. But the more that it becomes an expectation, the more that you can say, and I've also like if you were, uh, I don't know, giving a job talk. And somebody says, oh, you know, asks about about your research. You say, well, in, in addition to doing all this, you guys can check it yourselves. If you don't believe me, you can go and have a look. I've, you know, put this into the qualitative data repository. I've annotated this. And so you can go and check it out for yourselves if you want. And I think that could turn into a marker of credibility. But I don't think it is at the moment. I think if somebody said, oh, have you annotated this document, this, this, this journal article? And they said, no, I don't think that the default response there would be to say, oh, well, I, that's less credible. I think people would be like, oh, it, it's it's a nice to have, but it's not necessary. Is it basically how I think people see it at the moment, although that might be changing. Yeah, I think it also helps when you think about when in social science, we all often refer to elusive concepts, but uh, it reminds you that even your evidence and interpretation can be elusive as well. So. Right. So I think it might help if thinking in, in such terms yeah about this um so yeah what about the future any plans for more dissemination and further improvement for, for the tool um well um integrating the tool and this is something that the, the different uh publishers are doing integrating the tool is actually um 
easier even now, even than it was when I did it in 2017. They've made it more more routinized and easier to sort of put into uh, articles. I mean, one one problem we have here is that I mean, I don't know if this is your if what this is what you do commonly or not is that it doesn't work super well in a PDF, right? Mm. Necessarily, um, it can do so. You know. Adobe Acrobat can 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 support this, um, but it's not as good. It's not as seamless as it is if you're reading the article directly on the journal web page, right? And so that's something I think uh, an area where uh, it might be better, uh, where there's a, there's room for technological progress there, making it work better in PDFs. Um, although, like I say, it still actually does. In terms of what I'm doing, I'm, you know, like, like you said, I've written this article for so it's a practical guide. Um, I don't, I'm not the editor of any journals, so I can't put any policies in place. Although I do, you know, when I talk to journal editors, I inquire about their open access stuff and their transparency and all this kind of stuff. And whenever I'm asked to, like, I often bring up the analogy with um, quantitative data files and do files and stuff like this. Um, but that's something that. If you are interested, if you're a qualitative researcher and you think that open access and transparency and reproducibility is all a good idea, then that's something that you could, the people could bring up um, uh, when they're dealing with journal policies and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, it seems like the in in early early stages, but things start uh, with uh, raising awareness, uh, I think it's very important at least to start talking and debating about this and and uh, identifying the, uh, there is an issue and and helping ident identify the issue because um, for example, most of our talks last year they were focused on quantitative methods where yeah. reproducibility, where reproducibility is um, is quite a norm. In call research, it's a little bit tricky, so we tend to talk about more about transparency. But even transparency is not always fully there, and it's not easily achievable. But still, um, how do you how do you enhance the robustness of qualitative research? So, I think. Talks like ours, uh, small small steps in ensuring that we start about we start talking about issues and we start identifying solutions and we start sharing the solutions and disseminating knowledge about the solutions. So, and for this, um, I'm I'm really gra grateful to uh, to you that uh, yeah, and, and listen to have listened to such an interesting topic, eye opening. To be honest, yeah, I didn't know <laughs> it was possible. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having me uh, give this talk. Yeah, it's good. You're very welcome. I'm going to share this talk on our um, social media accounts. Um, yeah, and in, I, I will invite everyone to to watch it. <laughs> Thanks again. No worries.